For a pilot, I want to know what the best engine management practices are. We're going to find out in the hangar. I used to be a well-respected member of the aviation community, and then I started flying a Cirrus in that chain. Oh, that was great. Until the engine quit. And all of a sudden I see these explosions and these trees exploding. I'm walking away a better pilot because of this discussion. Welcome to In the Hangar. We're back with our IA and our AMP IA panel, and we're going to be talking about best practices for pilots on how to manage their engines. So, with us, let's go through quick introductions. To my right, okay, John Effinger, AMP pilot, um, IA, same thing. Uh, Bill Goebel, AMP IA uh, pilot, aircraft owner. Bill Ross, uh, Superior Air Parts, Vice President of Product Support. Uh, an aircraft owner, commercial pilot. I'm Scott Hayes with Superior Air Parts. I do sales and marketing. I'm a pilot. All right, great guys. So we're talking about engine management, and, and uh, let's just start. Bill, you wrote the book on engine management, <laughs> literally. So um, what for a pilot, and not talking to to AMPs, but talking to pilots, what are some of the key things that you want? Uh, pilots to know about how to properly manage their engine? Well, that's a very good question, and I'm asked that often about how do I operate my engine for longevity, efficiency, what's the best practice? And my canned answer is to do, to operate the engine in accordance with the pilot's operating handbook. When, when you do that, you're operating the engine in an envelope that has been tested for durability. Um, the mixture ratio curves, where to uh, operate the engine to get uh, what we call uh, the best brake specific fuel consumption or efficiency of the aircraft and engine combination has already been flight tested for you. When you operate outside that env envelope, then maybe you can do damage to the engine from a gross of attack point of view. Um, you know, I'm asked all the time, can I hurt my engine running Lena Peak? And the answer is generally not. But if I operate my engine Lena Peak outside of manufacturer's recommendations, a lot of people don't believe that, that aircraft manufacturers and engine manufacturers actually allow Lena Peak operation. But if you look in your many sure. POHs, there is a chart in there for Lena Peak operation. But if you go outside of those recommendations, we can do things like cavitate rings, cause accel accelerated wear within the cylinders uh, from a ring point of view, more corrosive attack. And I think in nowadays with uh, a desire to be kind to the engine, a desire to uh, save fuel because of the rising cost of fuel, rising cost of parts and, and, and just general operating costs, we want to be kinder. So a lot of our pilots out there are thinking cooler is better or operating leaner is better. Or, or a little further outside of the envelope is better. And actually, we're seeing more cam and lifter distress than we ever have in the industry. We're seeing a lot of these problems, and I think a lot of them are driven by people really not looking at what the manufacturer says to do, but taking it on their own to be a little kind. You never can go wrong in following manufacturer's recommendations for operation. Okay, so the takeaway is engine management is read your POH. Thank you very much. And we'll <laughs> um, so uh, what are some of the uh, big, you talked about like the temperature thing and being kind to the engine was, uh, explain that. I don't, I don't. Well, in, in a lot of uh, things that I have read over the recently, um, there's a lot of discussion about cylinder head temperature, for example. And uh, there are proponents that you should never exceed 380 degrees cylinder head temperature. So if we're sitting around on a park bench and we're talking and Bill hears me say that I'm going to target 380, but he's got two kids in college, he can't afford a new <laughs> engine, so 350 is his target. Scott over here decides that well, 350, 3, 330, 300 got, it has to be better. Right. So he leans further farther lean of peak, cooling the cylinder off, yes, and he thinks he's doing good to the engine, when actually we're setting up ring cavitation and a whole lot of scenarios in the engine where we can get a lot of corrosive attack, a lot of blow by, a lot of uh, unburnt fuel, uh, acids, lead deposits, and things like that that are highly corrosive within the engine, and then maybe 
Cam and Lifter Spalling is is right around the corner for him. And, and Bill have a follow-on question, and that'll be, hey, what's your oil temperature? And I'll say, oh, about 135, 140. And that's a, that's a good point, Scott. So, that, well, yeah, g g why, why is that <laughs> such a big deal? Well, uh, and, and, and I'm glad that you, there's a good segue into that, is that um, in doing all those, being kind to the cylinder, targeting 300 or whatever the number is, oftentimes the oil temperature suffers. This is the heat pump in the engine. This is what's creating the heat in the engine. And, and if we are not at the 380 degree range or whatever the, the manufacturer recommends, we can uh, start to get low oil temperatures. Uh, any oil company, any engine manufacturer, whether it be Shell or, or excuse me, oil company, whether it be Shell or Exxon or whoever, will uh, tell you that 180 degrees is the desired oil temperature as, long, as well as the engine manufacturers. That gives us enough temperature in the engine to cook the acids, the water, the combustion byproducts out of the engine. You know, these aircraft engines produce, if you're burning 15 gallons an hour, pick a number, 15 gallons an hour of fuel, they produce about 15 gallons of water through the combustion process. Wow, I did well, not realize that. Most of that goes out of the tailpipe in the form of vapor, but there is an element that gets by the rings that gets in your engine. So always cooler is not always better. Where do you find that information? Your Consult POH, maybe? That's right. <laughs> Consult your engine manufacturer, respective engine manufacturer, whoever that is, regarding that. Now, one of the things that I think is, is uh, kind of interesting, and I call it the big picture, is I have an owner that has a has a 210, a 310, a, a 182, whatever, and they, you know, that's like I went flying and I was able to get my fuel burn. I man, I pulled it out and it was great. Lean and peak and Richard, whatever your religion is with regards to that, and you know, I was able to do this and get my fuel burn. I said, okay, that's cool. That now you you're flying about 30, 40 hours. Yeah, that's great. My fuel burn it's super economical. Oh, you're driving an F-350 pickup truck to the airport. That's your daily driver, right? Well, yeah. What's your fuel burn on that? Well, that doesn't matter. It's like you're going through thousands of gallons on that, and you're killing this $50,000 engine by trying to just tweak, tweak, tweak. So right. you're, um, I think you may be focusing on the wrong efficiency. Well, we see that. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good point because when we're chasing those cylinder head temperatures, let's say we're going to, go, we're going to run further lean of peak, you, you've done it in your well, airplane, the airspeed falls well, off. Well, let's so throw one not, more thing we're that we're kind of missing out on here, too. Um, you know, you're talking Lena Peak, you're talking Richard Peak. Something we have today, now, as you guys are well aware, you're in the cylinder business. There's a lot of cylinders, and we were talking about that before. Engine monitors. Mm -hmm. They didn't have engine monitors before. Yep. You know, 20 years ago, the best you could do is get a rough idea of what your engine's doing. So today, Pilots are looking at the whole engine management system a whole lot more, uh, scrutinizing it, and that's where a lot of this, well, it's got to be better to run it this much cooler. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and then we've also got, uh, you know, with Continental, we got a new engine design out now. we got a new uh, fuel system installed on those engines. So we're getting closer to the modern-day automobile, and just because you have a mixture control, the modern engines are basically the same motors that they were on your automotive, and we still got an old tractor engine. We're still 50 years behind. We don't have variable valve timing. We don't have the injection systems that they have on these modern engines. So there's more to the fuel economy than just pulling back that mixture control. And that's where there's, I think there's a big problem where we're seeing a lot more damage to these engines. Well, you mentioned that cooler could be not good in the engine. You mentioned that they're already Lena Peak and they're going further Lena Peak to cool the engine off. Is it the same thing for if, if I'm running rich at Peak and I want to cool it and I give it more fuel, will it have the same problems of being too cool? Well, it, it can cause other problems, Dan. When you, if you're running, let's say you're accustomed to running best power, um, which is, you know, gives the maximum twist on the crankshaft, maximum airspeed on the, on the airplane, and you begin to richen outside of manufacturer's recommendations, you can actually burn exhaust valves by running too rich. By the accumulation of added combustion deposits that get underneath the valve and allow the valve not to close and seat properly during the combustion process, 
and that will torch the valve just like you go out in your shop and you light a torch and you burn a piece <clears throat> of metal. That's the exact same thing that's happened here. So running too rich can be problematic as well. But yes, you can, you can get to the same effect of, of running cool by running uh, rich. And I've, I've had issues with small bore continentals where the, the customer will be flying, they say, you know, if I pull it out back to 2200, you know, they just have a carbureted fixed pitch engine. No EGT, none of that. But if I pull it back to 2200, I'm down in the very bottom left of the bucket of my fuel curve, and I can just, you know, hardly use any fuel. It's like, that's great. But what you don't know is your cylinder head temperature has come down. Right. Your and and what is happening, and then they don't understand why. Yeah. Well, if you told me that at this point in the conversation as a pilot, I'm going, well, yay! It's the right. temperature's what, come what down. Happens, What's the issue? And the problem I find with the small bore continentals is the gaseous lead that's in the fuel. Instead of scouring out of the engine, going out the tailpipe, it'll manifest in the spark plugs. So on those small bore right. continentals, basically mash it up, and there's a point where it's just volume control. But basically, stay up at 2,500, 2,450, 2,500 RPM minimum, and it'll scour out. Your plugs will go 100 hours or more without being lead fouled. I've seen plugs get fouled at 25 hours because someone's trying to save fuel on their little Piper Cub. It's like you're doing it wrong. Just mash it up and go. And you're talking about the difference of maybe half a gallon an hour on a small bore engine. It's, I mean, it's chump change. We actually, as, as manufacturers like Homing Continental Superior Air Parts, uh, engines like you described that are being babied that are running at 65% power and below uh, in some of those mission profiles for whatever you're doing with the aircraft, we actually recommend that you operate the engine at peak exhaust gas temperature to effectively get as much heat and, and to avoid some of the yeah. problems that, that Bill's talking about here. And you, right. you, scare, you scare your valve faces, you scare your plug, you, you know, all that, that turbulence in there, it's taking it and it's throwing it out the tailpipe, which is what you want to do. All right, so the big takeaway for us pilots is that cooler isn't always better and to run it within side of your POH things. Right, and I think w one real critical path that maybe we don't really touch on is we as manufacturers, because we do much more than cylinders, we do parts as well as whole engines on the experimental as well as the mm -hmm. certified side, is that when we go to certify that, we have some very specific things we have to achieve in that. So one of which is to drive things to the point of failure. So when we published that POH, we didn't do it off of, hey, I think this would be good. We did it off of, here's the parameters. You know, if you run one cylinder absolutely at the red line for four, five, six hours. So a lot of the things we bake into that POH are part of that testing and certification process. Would you agree? That's exactly right. And when we when we certify these products, we have to configure these cylinders to run at 460, in the case of your airplane, Dan, the limit is 460 degrees F, um, and we have to do Don't whatever. Don't ever do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, As good. I get, I'll give you that. I, I'm only up at 450, <laughs> you know, no problem. We do the durability testing at those temperatures. We have to. It's regulatory in nature. Um, but the reality of it is, is that the when the engine was designed, it was really designed for, for in the case of your 210, the engine was designed for the fits and limits to be optimal at around the 380 degree range. Right. Also 380 mm -hmm. degrees, and, and there's some variability as, as far as that. That also provides for good oil temperature. All right, good, all right. So we don't, in the, the little bit amount of time that we have left, let's talk about what are some other uh, really good practices. Um, you know, what about, uh, I, I didn't know about this until, you know, I, I bought a plane and, and brought in a John that uh, he was real big mm -hmm. about preaching about getting my oil sample tested. You know, what are some other, what are some things that are really Well, good? the oil sample is just one of the preventative maintenance items. You can do, it's, it's not, just because you're doing an oil sample, that's not the only part of it. You gotta inspect your filter plates, you know. The, mm -hmm. the oil sample is a criteria for certain kinds of metals, certain <clears throat> kinds of wares, <clears throat> whereas the, uh, they won't filter out uh, the larger, materials that you'll see with the oil filter. So you got to work them in combination. Okay. And the, the, the oil sample is not, you don't just get an oil sample and it's like, I have a full story. The oil sampling, it's a trend. So now you're going to you're going to get an oil sample and in 50 hours you're going to get an oil sample. Yeah. And, and what you're looking for is what you're going to look in. yeah, what you're going to do is looking for a trend. You're going to see at break at breaking, you're going to have your irons going to be real high. 
and then other metals will be well, low. And then at, at end of life, you may have see other metals go up. You may see silicon come up. Where's silicon come from? Sand, right. oil filter, or air filter. So again, the what I preach is do oil samples and watch it. It's and not the, because it's the one sample, and I agree. Yeah. And, and I remember at one point we got a sample back, and, and I was really pleased with the lab for how they gave us a story, yep. a yep. narrative mm -hmm. that said, okay, we're seeing a lot of this and this and this. Um, it's not cause for too much concern now, but let's see at the next one. And sure enough, on the next one, it came down. So it was just a, yep. you know, it was just a thing. Mm -hmm. So it's um, like a heartbeat. You're, and yeah. you may have an irregular this week, but next week. Okay, so. real quick, what what other things? The biggest thing, in my opinion, and I I'm sound like a broken record with <laughs> Man POH <laughs> manufacturers instructions, but I think is an owner that's not a non A and P and not familiar mm. with service bulletins and all right. that. Uh, I think the biggest thing that they can do is ensure that their mechanic is maintaining their airplane in accordance with manufacturer's instructions, that they have the tools, equipment, and training to do that. I hear this all the time. I've got the best mechanic in the world. He worked for United Airlines for 40 years. <laughs> United <laughs> Airlines doesn't fly Cessna no. 210s. <laughs> so, but, in, and, and we have to look at the, the mechanic, make sure he's got the things to maintain the Cessna 210. He may be great on Airbus, but maybe not on your airplane. That's the biggest thing that I think that owners can do. Go in the shop and, and ask those questions. Well, and it made me feel really comfortable, uh, first of all, that uh, a couple of other plane owners had recommended John, but the fact that it's not that you won't work on a, a Piper or something like that, but that you are the Cessna guy. Yes. And having a Cessna, that gave me a lot of comfort, knowing that you know the 210. You have the jacks to be able to, to, to raise it higher than what is normal and, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And, and yeah, I, so I agree with that. Yeah, an AMP is really not hard to get. Hell, they gave me one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other last, uh, what would be good? What, what I, just a real quick nugget. What I try to do with, with my customers is, and in today's world, is take your maintenance manual, PDF, parts manual, PDF, your engine operating manual, PDF, and your airframe uh, parts manual, maintenance manual, PDF, put it on a thumb drive, put it in the glove box. And the reason is, anywhere you're traveling, anywhere you're traveling, you come into John's uh, shop, he may not have worked on a 210, but you've got every bit of data that he needs to troubleshooting that. So when you're doing oh, cross country stuff. I had thought of that. Yeah, keep, it, keep that with so you. So keep PDFs on the plane. Keep it um, on the plane. And on thumb stuff. drives. And That's then that great. way, that way to, to Bill's point, you've got that mechanic, if you get stuck, or this is the other thing is, you can pull it up, you can pull it up where you get stuck and say, let me call John, my guy, well, that's and he will, he will translate that for you and tell you what to touch and what not to touch. Yeah, I had to have a shop in, in Pennsylvania called John because he didn't know how to put a generator belt on a 210. Exactly. So, alternator. Uh, alternator belt, too. Yeah. Alternator belt. Yeah. And then we, tells you how much I know. then we fixed everything when came surrounding the alternator when broke. I returned. Yeah. Yeah. So. But you know, right. when I was in but, AMP school, I never saw a Cessna 210. We overhauled no. or right. we worked on a... Cessna L19 Bird Dog oh, wow. engine. So when you, my point is, is that when you get an AMP, it's actually a license to learn. Just like as private pilots, right. you get a private pilot license, doesn't mean we can go jump in a Learjet. <laughs> right. And 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 based on all of that, I guess that's why I like to just work on the Cessnas. I pick one brand of aircraft. Mm -hmm. Sure, you know, I've worked on Bell 430s. Right. You know, I've, I've worked shuttle. on <laughs> Space Shuttle. I've worked on Harrier 88s. <laughs> Uh, but whatever you're current with, you're up to date on the common failures, you're up to date on the right. bulletins, you're up to date on just the whole configuration of that aircraft. And if you stick with something like that and you get more proficient with it over time, you're really better off if you go in a shop and you see twin engine aircraft, you see an old dope and fabric cub. Um, generally you'll see that they, either they've got a dozen people working there right. and there's guys that specialize in those areas or you got two or three guys that know a little bit about this a little bit about that and it's not to degrade them or take anything yeah. away from it they're they don't know there's no way to know all the particulars on an aircraft model specific right. unless that's what you concentrate exactly on right. i wouldn't i wouldn't go near a harrier today i wouldn't go <laughs> near a 206 or a 407 bell um, you know i don't even remember how to pin the cowling open right. so you know yeah. that's something to think about when you're looking at a shop and you're looking for 
more model specific um, aircraft. Good point. All right. Well, thanks, guys. I really appreciate you coming out and uh, sharing with us uh, best practices for engine maintenance. So, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you for watching, and I hope you got something out of this. As pilots, let's read those POHs and make sure that we're staying within the, the confines of what they've written. And if you like the show, please share, watch, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time in the next.